Hey everybody, welcome. This is Catherine Bleich and you are tuned in to Conversations in Anarchy. Today is a really special episode. We're changing the agenda. Today we are going to be talking about how to talk to people about anarchy. The holiday season is upon us. We're having dinner with our family and sometimes things get heated. So we want to have a conversation today about how to talk to other people, how to share your ideas without pushing them away, starting a family feud, food being thrown across the table, people slamming the door. How many of you have had that happen before? I know there have been some awkward turtle meals in my family when I start running my mouth too much. So today we're going to talk about how to conversate in, a, in an effective way. Today I am joined with two of my favorite people who work for Anarcha Poco. We've got David and Angel. Would the two of you please introduce yourselves? Sure. Hey, I am Angel Robinson. I am. Uh, I was the editor for the Anarchist Guide to the Galaxy. I am helping to organize the Free Your Family Camp with David. I am an event producer, a armchair philosopher. Um, love to study economics and think about how to create better worlds for people. Um, you know, how we get to a flourishing society for all. Um, and I'm super happy to be here with you guys and talking turkey <laughs> and anarchy. Hey, gobble, David. gobble. Gobble, gobble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a great time of the year. I'm really excited to have this conversation with all you freedom champions and lovers out there. That's what I am. I love freedom. I've uh, been attending North Poco since the beginning and just excited to be helping out, contributing to the family camp stage this year. And um, I'm super about liberating children and empowering them, get them out of the state school system, these day prisons. I'm a principal of a private school to accelerate graduation. And um, yeah, very excited about this conversation we're going to have about anarchy, about talking about anarchy. It's kind of a meta conversation, um, but um, man, I'm really excited to, uh, to be with you and, uh, and have this, this chat. Awesome. So yes, today we're talking about the conversation and the reason we hold this here every Tuesday is to bring the community together. We love each other and not all of us have met each other in person yet so it's a really great way to come together and have a conversation but a lot of us are going to be getting together with loved ones this week and in the months to come but before we get talking I want to go over some ground rules. Again I'm Catherine. I'm co-producing this year's Anna Capoco. I do the health and wellness and we are all really excited to have you guys here and coming in February. Okay, so first and foremost, we want to be welcoming of everybody. We practice nonviolent communication here. We all have different opinions, although sometimes it feels like we're preaching to the choir, but there are nuanced differences within the anarchist community. So we are loving toward one another. If we disagree, we can communicate in a kind, loving way. We have people tuned in all over the internet right now on DLive, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, and right here on Zoom. Please say hi. Put in the comments where you are tuning in from today. We would like to know. And better yet, since it's a special day, where are you right now? And if you're celebrating Thanksgiving or not, I'd like to know if you celebrate Thanksgiving where you are, ever you are in the world. Okay. So with that being said, let's go through a couple more of these ground rules. So usually we open up by having a little slide and talking about some key points. Today's going to be a little different. Today's going to be a little bit more casual. We're going to be sharing our real life experiences of do's and don'ts when it comes to talking about anarchy. There is Simone in Guatemala celebrating Friendsgiving. I've been to a couple Friendsgiving events. That's really fun. Um, so today's going to be a little bit more casual, trying out a new model for our little intermission within the regularly scheduled programming. Um, don't be shy. Turn on your camera. We would love to see you. If you are in the Zoom call right now, feel free to turn on your camera. You don't have to turn on your audio if you don't want to speak, but we love it when you do. If you're feeling like you're having trouble jumping in, click the raise your hand button, and I can see that on my screen, and I will make sure to call on you. You can also write questions in the chat. Sometimes I miss those. 
So if David or Angel or someone is watching those as well, you can definitely address those. We do have moderators who are watching all the other feeds. So write your questions and comments in there. And I get a message in my Telegram that lets me know. Okay, again, nonviolent communication. Usually we use our new ebook, The Anarchist Guide to the Galaxy, which was written in part by David and edited by Angel. And we usually kind of have that there as a read along. We're not necessarily using it today, but there's something I want to bring up. It's an excellent tool to introduce people to anarchy. So over the holidays, if you're sitting around the table and someone's like, huh, I need to learn more about that, you can pull up anarchapoco.com and actually have them download the ebook in real time. So you can have that ebook delivered to them right there at the dinner table and make sure that when they go home, they've got some quality reading so that they can really get a grasp on who we are and what we believe. So with that being said, I know that myself, especially during the Ron Paul campaign, I had some very strong opinions and I probably ruined some family meals. <laughs> <laughs> and so today we kind of want to talk about our experiences. I don't know, David or Angel, do either of you want to kick us off, share something? So, uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's interesting because we always see all the memes on um, online. And I think like you, when I, in the Ron Paul days, and I was like raring to go and enthusiastic, and I just wanted to talk to everybody about all the things. And I thought that they were going to just understand what I was saying. And it always devolved because I was, I was not, <laughs> I was not really taking in my surroundings and, and really just not, um, not sure how to communicate yet. I just had a lot of enthusiasm, and I think over time we start, we go through some phases, right? Like you have this enthusiasm, excitement, you want to share with everyone, and then it doesn't turn out the way that you think, and then it's like, oh, what's wrong with you people? You know, like, sheeple, you just don't want to listen, and like you go through that phase, and maybe when you're in that phase, you're getting a little more. You're you're not communicating well, right? You're hard to you're hard to listen to, and then you go, and then hopefully you get to the stage where there's some acceptance and some understanding, right? Like, okay, I got to talk to these people, and I got to figure out what their motivations are, and maybe I can make them see that we care about the same things, and there are different ways to get there, right? That's what I'm thinking. So. So hopefully that's what we're going to do in this conversation is we can talk some things out and then figure out ways not to, to say that in a way that's not like accusing them, poking them, calling them status, because I have called people status before. <laughs> <laughs> I, try not to, I try not to do that. Although actually I find that you can say a lot of things with a smile and people will be okay. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like sitting at the dinner table, how do we say, how do we show people that we care about the world and and explain our point of views in ways that are not hostile and that, you know, brook agreement? Yeah, I think you said the key word, Angel, was that care. And there's a great cliche, and it's really true, is that people don't um, care how much you know until they know how much you care. And mm. that's true, right? Like, we, we're humans, after all. And the statist belief and the state of mindset is something that's been drilled into us at least for 12 years in the state school system and then reinforced with the movies, with the media. I mean, it is drilled in there. You got the flag, you know, we're going to see like, uh, I was a big sports guy. I love sports, right? But like you look at the, the football games, you know, on Thanksgiving and it's just like flag salute the troops. And you're like, those guys are heroes, you know, in the movies. And so it's like, my conclusion, just, you know, the Ron Paul stuff and all these things is like, I'm just here to give information. And this is one of the takeaways I got from Larkin Rose. I mean, much, many of the takeaways, he said, doctors don't heal broken bones. Doctors align broken bones and the body heals itself. And so when I'm communicating with these loving people, people that I love, right? The, your family, your close family, your, your kind of um, extended family. And you're like, here, this is, you know, these are criminals, you know, and the taxation is theft. And it's just like, yeah, whatever. You know? And it's not like it doesn't hit him at a deeper level. You're like, that's a huge revolution, man. It's theft, man. It's wrong. <laughs> and um, and like you said, I try not to ruin the dinners, but just kind of like be 
be be respectful of their views, but then it's like we have something good. And I can't I can't ram it down their throat as much as I get excited. I'm like, this is the this is the truth, right? And all these like incredible like mindset, but it's like, well, it might be a truth, it might be my truth, but it, it's not their truth. So to find out where they are in their journey, do they even care? You know, I have family members that uh, were in the military and like their family was going to the military. And it gave them a couple stories of death and deception and, you know, false flags. And they don't care. And I'm just like, I don't understand why you don't care. So if uh, some of you people listening out there can, uh, can help me find people or help people care about, like, not hurting people, <laughs> I don't know how you do that. But, like, that's a great – that would be a great solution to, to begin with in this conversation. Well, I think something you said, David, is really important. And it's where are they? can you meet them where they are and if you can find where they are and meet them there and then maybe instead of saying you should believe something different we could offer a hand and walk with them toward a different solution and sometimes people aren't ready to hear taxation is theft because for them taxation is feeding hungry people and providing health care and all these different things right so you say taxation is theft and it's like what what? But I know, Angel, one of the things you mention a lot when we're just kind of having our conversations is kind of figuring out if people have an underlying belief that violence is a problem, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, because everybody does. I don't want to say everybody, but that's but like most people do. <laughs> most people don't believe themselves to be violent. Most people um, will not advocate violence. Um, they most people will say that they want to live in a peaceful society. And, they, and and to some extent, they think that we are living in a peaceful society because they don't make the connection between um, taxation and violence or regulations and violence. And so whenever I start a conversation with anyone about anything that has to do with politics, um, you know, before we start talking about building a wall or you know regulate it or building roads or regulating uh, or even schools i'm just like wait a minute stop let's <laughs> let's stop for a minute do you believe it's okay to hit people and like really simple do you think it's okay to hit people to ever be the first person to hit people um and then once you got them saying no no i don't once you got them already agreeing with you about how we should live that's when you can start to build on okay so well if we don't agree if, i mean if we agree that you know you can't just go out and hit people um what are the circumstances under which you can use violence right is it when someone's doing something to you in defense most people will agree that you do it in defense but that you can never never go hit anyone um th that's a good place to start if you're wondering how to talk about pe talk, how to talk to people about the ideas is to to start there um and then like you said kat and david also um figure out what it is they care about i might be super anti-war and my neighbor might not like that or my family they like just don't care like that's not that's not a thing they're going to think about they're not going to change their worldview because of something happening in iraq um so it i you know i talk to people if you really want to introduce anarchy or freedom. I think you figure out what their motivations are. What do you like to talk about? You want to talk about the wall? Then yeah, let's talk about the wall. And then you figure out how these larger principles fit into creating the type of world that they want to see. Um, that was one of the things I think we learned during the Ron Paul came campaign when they were talking to us about you know going knocking on doors which we were doing is like don't go up there talking about all the things you care about <laughs> okay <laughs> not what they care about and that means i don't think i got that memo <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know i know it's rough because of like especially if you're participating in politics like it's because you're you can you care about something and you want to like you know spread it out to the world but okay yeah, like so real quick someone is asking in the chat what our conversation's about and i did see some people are jumping in late so today we're doing an intermission from our regular schedule and we're talking about how to talk about anarchy with our friends and family over the holidays so that's the conversation for today 
And we would love for you to jump in. And, and right where we are right now is we're talking about kind of meeting people where they are, finding out what their interests are, kind of bringing them along as opposed to being really abrasive, like maybe <laughs> some of us have been in the past. I know that I, for one, have been. Um, sorry to cut you off there, Angel. I just wanted to make sure because a couple of people have commented that they weren't sure what was going on. So, Michael, Ken, all of you, we would love to have you join us in the conversation today because I know all of you are opinionated people and articulate people. Um, there's also some comments coming in that everyone should consider reading some books like How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I think that's a great set of advice. It's been a while since I've actually read that, but um, you know, figuring out how to conversate with people in a way that turns them on instead of turning them off is kind of where we're going right now. Right. I want to add something too. Like, also, if we think about our own journey and how we became voluntarists or you know anarchists or however, however you identify, you know, myself, I actually just identify as a human being. Right. And there's different labels and all these things. But like, I believe in a voluntary type of philosophy. And so um, how did I come across, you know, these kind of ideas and what opened my mind and then see where they're at. And then the other part I want to just mention in the beginning of the conversation is how important it is because we're like people listening here live and in the future. Like we're the, I don't know, the flag bearers of no flag. You know, we're like the kind of representatives of this new evolution of human consciousness. And this is why I get so excited about anarchy and voluntarism is because it is an actual solution, right? Once you get the concept that you own yourself and initiating violence is the problem, like coercion is the problem, then for me it was so liberating and, and then it kind of set myself mentally free. So just like these ideas are not going to come from mainstream news. They're not going to come from TV or movies or whatever, like we're kind of the representatives of it. So this is why I want to get better. And um, one of the things that Jeff Berwick, the founder of Narcopoco, does frequently or a couple times in his talks, he asks the audience who owns themselves. And at some conferences, you know, like, I don't know, a small amount of people do. And he's like, well, what about the rest of you guys? Like, who owns you guys? And I've never heard that question from anyone other than a voluntarist or anarchist. Because it's a really weird question of like, who owns you? And the kind of presupposition is that somebody owns you or the state or like, you know, something. And so how to take that first step of, um, of realizing that this message is not going to come from anybody else. It's going to come from us or, you know, we, the, the books that we mentioned here, um, the videos, maybe some like songs. But that natural progression of awakening to these ideas uh, is very personal, but it's really important, you know, so I'm always trying to get better and, uh, you know, have compassion with people. And, um, you know, I get excited about it and, you know, I'm talking, but like, um, ultimately that's just like, here's the facts. And then, you know, if you want to go with it and, and run with it, that's cool. The other one, a question I got from Larkin Rose is, can you delegate a right that you don't have? Again, mm. another question, I'm just like, who comes up with these ideas of these, 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 um, revelations because it's like if I don't have the right to steal your stuff then can you delegate that right to somebody else it's like no you cannot so again those are like earth shattering type revelations for me and starting that planting the seed and then maybe you know we'll come back in six months or a year or something and I've been going to Narcopoco this will be my sixth year but like a lot of my family members could give two shits you know they're like that's cool you know I'm like this is awesome. The crypto and the health. Blah, blah, blah. That's cool. You know, it's like, all right, I invite my friends. I invite my people, my, my family, but um, it's a process. And uh, I think just kind of understand that it is important and it's so important. We got to be for myself personally, I got to be more compassionate, more loving so that they open their mind and be like, okay, whatever's going on here, maybe I should consider it instead of like, you're wrong and kind of pass that anger phase of this is the right way versus there's a million different ways. But you, who owns you? If you're going to interact voluntarily, then that's a great starting point because then we can have a nice, mutually respectful relationship. And, uh, you know, these are just starting points, I think, in the, in the beginning of the conversation, you know, we can focus on. So, David, you know, so what I hear, what I heard you say a couple of times is like Larkin Rose asks a question 
um, mm. Jeff Berwick ask a question. Maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's part of the key to talking to people is not to go, hey, 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 this is how it is, mm. but to just ask questions and let and lead them like the Socratic method, right? You lead them to the, especially when you know what the answers are, <laughs> but lead them to the conclusions that you want to lead them to by asking questions. I think that's a good one. Yeah. I like, love that. Like, I'm not trying to lead them anywhere. It's just kind of like, well, lead them to you on yourself, freedom. But like some people, <laughs> sometimes they're not ready, you know? So it's like, I just leave them where it is. But then I get so excited because I love these ideas, man. It's like, no, you know, I want to lead you to it. But it's like, it, it has to be. Uh, their own realization, I think. So plant mm -hmm. seeds. And then Larkin said something funny, you know, he's like, sometimes um, people will come up to me and say, you know what? I was thinking about what you said five years ago and I'm starting to understand what you, what you meant. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Ew, humans are amazing <laughs> to think about it for five years and then finally well, goes, I got it. Yeah. You know that saying, David, you can lead a horse water but you can't make him drink you right so, yeah you cut out a little bit Kat. water and you just said yeah oh okay yeah i was saying people where they are you know and i think that's really important that if there's someone who is so stuck in their belief system and so rigid you don't need to fight with them it's okay and sometimes just dropping one uh-oh we're losing little you. seed one little nugget it, that they <laughs> let me see what's going on with my internet i heard you i heard you say drop one little nuggy drop one little seed and i think that's real you know like um you know i i was raised christian but i'm not like super religious now and that kind of thing but the bible does have some good wisdom and there's a story of like planting the seed and like planting trying to plant it on the hard rock or the good soil and that can go for you know religious belief or you know freedom or whatever it is but like there's got to be a, a fertile soil, and I would correlate that to like an open mind and a seeker, you know, somebody who is actually asking questions and seeking, because I mentioned before, sometimes you can ask questions or, you know, converse with people, and they have no interest in what, you know, maybe would empower them or liberate them. And, you know, it's like, if you don't know you're part of a jail system, then why would you want get, to get out? You know, it's like, it's kind of seeing the jail system that we're in or the mental slavery. And now we're like, man, how do I get out of this financial debt system or um, the education system, the health system? There's like all these different, you know, prisons that we're in. And if someone's like, nah, you know, GMOs are good, you know, vaccines are great, forced schooling's awesome, you know, it's like, yeah, it's no big deal. It's like, well, see, I got to go, buddy. See you later. I, I'm going to head out, you know? So <laughs> come back in five or 10 years. <laughs> you guys... Have you guys ever read um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People? Jay mentioned this book, and um, I had a friend um, mention it to me. He said to me, you need to read this, and I read it. Um, and I really, really love this book because it's all of the things you probably already know about how to communicate with people and how to speak to their interests. Um, and, how, and also just how to be interested in what other people have to say. Um, and I've, I think it's one of those reads that along with nonviolent communication, that's really important for us as anarchists to just get out of the mindset of telling people what to do, um, it, so, such that we do sometimes and then, and getting into how do I make myself heard? How, how, what can I say? How can I be, you know, and you know, that's a thing I've been thinking about a lot. So it's, Creating that fertile was that fertile land and that open mind is also about being likable. So and not attack. So like, let's say here's a good one, right? Um, here's a not what not to do. Um, you are like the reason you believe the things you believe is because you've been propagandized for however many years. Like, like you, okay. So like saying that you can say that very same thing, but if you say it like that, then they, it, there's a defensiveness. It's like, no, I haven't been. Are you trying to say someone got something over on me? And it makes them defensive. And, and like, we don't want them defending 
these ideas, we want to lead them to the idea that like, isn't it crazy how much they put this stuff on TV? Like, that's a very different question. Isn't it crazy how frequently they're putting this stuff on TV to, to like try to get us to believe these things? So in the one instance, you're saying you are the problem, you've been propagandized, you've been bamboozled. And on the other hand, you're saying, you're saying you're telling them to look at something, to just observe something and come to, and you're hinting at the conclusion, right, um, that they should come to and helping them to be more receptive to it. So that's like another big one, like a do not do this at the Thanksgiving table. Do not tell people they are, <laughs> they've been fooled because that also means <laughs> <a> fool. <laughs> But they have been fooled. <laughs> that right. is to say, they haven't. We've all been fooled desperately and deeply for generations. But Kat, mm -hmm. I want to ask you something about because you've been an activist for you know over ten years in in the trenches. Have you have you come across the idea like people are already anarchists, like they're already voluntarists? It's just a matter of like shifting a couple things. Or what's your thoughts on like people like because a lot of people would agree stealing is wrong, and like Angel mentioned, violence is bad generally. So like they're already there. It's just this kind of weird belief in a flag and, you know, some like imaginary borders on the, on the dirt here. Um, do you think people like are there already? Just a matter of them getting a few questions asked perhaps? Or did she freeze? She, uh, until she gets back on, I would Phil? say. Yeah, go ahead. There you go. Now am I back? You're back. <laughs> and you're not <laughs> you, you can take it angel take it angel. i mean because this is what i understand okay or danny has got two cents that to chime in yes yeah <laughs> i'm going to unmute danny hey danny oh, it's getting a bit freezing but yeah with, with with talking with people yeah it is important to not attack them and what i usually do is if if you hear them complain about something, go go and talk about that and make them think about it a bit. But it can be hard because sometimes I do get angry a bit because they keep on going back to the same issue and they don't think about it. And I think, oh man, it's so clear. I don't, ah, I don't. That is go wrong, you know, like like with my mom or something. They hear you hear they complain something about the news, and I think. Oh, why do you even care? You know, it's not real or it's not, you know, and then you can really tire, but yeah, it's, it's just hard, especially with them crowds, like a family uh, table with a dinner. I, th I don't even know how to do that, to be <laughs> honest. I usually do it one by one. And then usually it, it's more about health uh, things. Then I start the topic because then I can say, and that's not even allowed. Is that not a problem, do you think? You know, then I go a bit like that, but it's hard. It, I don't think it's one clear answer for every situation. It's person to person, and um, yeah. D Danny, do you have kids at all? No. Uh, I, I ask that question because I think one of the things I've learned from having kids um, is that not everything needs to take place in the moment. Like every, you don't need every, you want to teach your kids all of these lessons, right? And you want them to take in the lessons. And then, um, you know, when I was younger with my first daughter, like that was very much how it was. It's like, I felt like I needed to like get her to understand right in the moment. And then over the course of watching her grow up, I noticed that like, oh, okay, I was so worried about this. And she kind of, and it kind of just resolved itself. You know, she kind of just grew out of it or whatever it was. And I think that's kind of how we have to look at our conversations with people um, is like, yeah all right, I'm going to talk to you and I'm not going to get angry with you because in this moment you just don't get it. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. This is just my, you know, like this is my perception of the world. You can have yours. And then I think that helps them to be open to like seeing the world outside of your conversation because they're going to hear what you're saying, right? And then when they go out and they see an example of what you said, if they're not feeling like that example of what you said is an attack on them because they're connecting it with your attack on them, then I think that's one of the ways, you know, and that's why we, we just have to be patient. We just have to go, okay, you're just not going to get it today and that's okay. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it, that's important to be patient and little bits at a time. I usually do that, but sometimes, like with my mom, I see that a lot of times, and I was like, oh, no, I cannot <laughs> handle it anymore, you know? And but, you know, also, yeah. Danny, so interesting is that our family members have our, like, our heartstrings. Like, we care so much about them, and it's yeah. like so interesting how our, our parents are like, we want to convert our parents or our siblings or them the most, and then, like, they have those decades of programming to, uh, to continue there. So I see, um, thanks for sharing, Dan. I'm going to see if I can unmute Michael here. Kath, I don't know if uh, you're connected to this. So let me see if I can unmute Michael. Hey, Michael, how are you, man? I'm doing good. Can you hear me? Fine. Yeah, we got you. Ah, wonderful. Hey, David, a shout out to you, man. Uh, I just watched your uh, interview with Richard Grove, and that was an that was, uh, excellent interview, man. I really, yeah. really appreciated that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As well as uh, one you did with Amanda this week, too. You guys are just, you're nailing it and uh, you know, much appreciated. We got to create, we, I mean, just like we're saying, it's the importance of these conversations. We're the ones, you know, we're the ones we've been, we've been waiting for. And so as much as opportunities come, reach out to people, you know, create. Even if you got two, two subscribers or two people on your email list, doesn't matter. Just start building, you know. You don't start Absolutely. lifting 200 pounds. You start lifting two pounds. You know, those little, right. little little weights for grandma, and then pretty soon five pounds and ten pounds, little by little, you know, we're getting stronger. These messages are getting out. I mean, these are these are real solutions. That's what's so crazy is that once people bang their head up against this Capitol building for a few years and call the politicians and email and write letters, and these guys don't give two shits about me, man. So maybe they're criminals. Maybe they're robbing and murdering people. Yeah, you know, these ideas are around. So. Um, anyways, how, how do you talk to people about anarchy? Is it I, I like what we're going for, like asking questions. That's a really yes. exciting thing. But what do you think? Yes. Yeah, I think this is a great topic and great timing, as a matter of fact, too. So whoever thought of that one, uh, well done. Because this is this is really the time to, to be able to talk to people. And certainly, I think one of the things in regard to talking to people is listening skills. You know, this is the thing that most people don't uh, don't have these days. And if we can display that, if we can actually, you know, demonstrate our ability to listen, uh, that that's going to get people's attention because most people don't hear other people's point of view. They just they just want to spout out their point of view, and and they're just waiting when other people are talking for them to talk as well. And so us listening, but it's also kind of an entrepreneurial thing as well because. Entrepreneurs are, are good at listening because they're listening for people's needs. And when you hear what other people need, that's, that's your opportunity to try and steer them towards a solution. And, you know, of course, we've got, you know, tons of solutions. Our, our, you know, our point of view, I think, is the most logical point of view that's out there. It's just a matter of, you know, getting people to understand that, you know, we've got something to say, but it's until we, uh, you know, establish that line of communication. I don't know. I saw a, uh, a NBC presentation in which they were talking about like a tube. And they were saying that like you, if you try and put your handkerchief in one side of the tube and the other person is trying to put their handkerchief in the other side of the tube, well, me, either one is going to get through. But unless you w wait until you can pull their handkerchief through, then you then the, the thing is clear and you can put your thing through, you know. And so that's kind of what you got to uh, think about is really uh, taking that opportunity to really, you know, hear them out and, and actually kind of, you know, uh, make them feel like they're being heard. And I, I think that's really good approach and not only that but it's also a good approach you know as far as an entrepreneur or somebody that's a problem solver or someone that's uh, you know looking to uh to get a job or, or create a, a a good atmosphere at work uh, there's all kinds of ways that uh, you know that this works for us but uh, it's certainly uh, one i also wanted to point out uh, you know in regard to asking questions that that is uh one in which you're really, when you're asking questions, you're, you're stirring people's minds to get them thinking. And thinking people is really what we want. You know, because when people are thinking, they're, they're a lot more peaceful. 
and it, it's just when they when they've been triggered and they've got they're in that emotional state that they'll do harmful things or when they feel threatened but when they're thinking yeah. usually that's not that's not what's happening and, and you and you know that like when most people are threatened or when they're traumatized or when they're stressed they can't think very well but that's what we want to do we want to try and encourage people to be comfortable you know to feel like they're being heard and then certainly encourage them to think about things and that's how you do it is ask questions and so i i know richard grove is one that uh you know mentions this quite a bit and he says you know just add a question mark to the end of whatever your statement is you're a status <laughs> exactly. and that's and that's enough to get get things started <laughs> Michael, I was going to ask you questions. Um, do you, okay, so is your whole family politically aligned with you, or do you have interactions with family, whether it's Thanksgiving or not, where, like, how do those interactions usually go for you? Yeah, you know, it's it's pretty funny because it's, it's almost like uh, a lot of the people that used to be, you know, like I was kind of the rebel, I was the one that was the you know, I was gonna. I went into the army when I was seventeen, and I was just like, "I gotta do my, I gotta do my service. I gotta be the hero. I gotta save our country, and all that kind of stuff." And and uh, you know, that was me at like seventeen, twenty ish. And by the time I am now, well, I'm completely the opposite. And now, those all those people that called me crazy then, they've kind of graduated to where I was back then and so they're they're wondering hey we're the ones that are waving the flag i thought you liked us waving the flag what, what's going on you know so they're they're confused but they're just you know a few years behind me i guess to some degree yeah but yeah um, you, it is you, one you oh, evolved you evolved michael absolutely absolutely and i think you know that's that's a sign of progress i think we we're always changing you know, and so that's that's another thing that I think is really a good thing that we should be encouraging people to continually be changing and, and looking for ways that they can improve themselves. And and, you know, like those are another opportunity where, you know, we can maybe ask them, what would they like to do? You know, where would they like to be? What kind of things do they like to do and, and start in that direction where we, you know, like we can demonstrate our open-mindedness in regard to helping them you know because in a lot of cases you know if uh you know like uh, you run into somebody that's a trump supporter or somebody else a trump hater the, the thing that they're they're really they're going to blow their mind is when you agree with them you say you know i Trump is the man. And it's, oh, i i agree with you you know <laughs> and what <laughs> I, I was thinking the opposite. I was thinking the opposite. Like when they complain about somebody, they're like, "Oh, Biden this or Warren that or or, or Sanders." They're like, yeah, that guy sucks. You know, that guy's terrible. You know, <laughs> and it is. I mean, this is kind of and it's we're being truthful. You know, it's yes. like, yeah, you know, those guys aren't good. Just the solution isn't the the red team or the blue team. You know, we have to totally right. transcend that. And um, so, yeah, those are some good points, uh, Michael. Looks like we got Catherine back on the line. Catherine, I was asking you about her. like people, yeah, people being like naturally voluntarist or naturally anarchist. I don't know if um, you have some thoughts on that or kind of anywhere that um, you want to go. In I the... think we're born anarchists. I think we're born anarchists and you can usually lead people back there. Although there are some people who believe that force is ethical, like with vaccines and things like that, like lost a friend in college because she told me that she would have, if it was up to her, someone forcibly vaccinate my children. And I blocked her on everything because I didn't want her having access to my family, right? So I lost a college friend in that regard. And, um, and that's okay. You know, we were just so far apart. But I think a lot of people, they want freedom for themselves. And that's really what it comes down to, you know, is that if you can find like Michael was saying, you know, find some common ground, find something to agree on and show them how freedom works there. If they really want a wall, but they really want a different type of freedom, focus on what you guys agree on and show them that you are 
a decent human being through the way you conversate, right? And honor them and, and respect them, ask them questions. Um, I think you can lead a lot of people there and especially through the process of inquiry. I have question everything tattooed on my arm. I don't know if y'all can see that, uh, but I got That's that awesome. in 2008. Yeah, after the Ron Paul campaign, when for me, I realized that I was looking up to leadership and I needed to be looking within. And I thought I just cashed out my life savings. I gave two and a half years to this campaign. And I went and got question everything tattooed on me because I realized that my belief system was based on falsity, right? I believed that a person could liberate me outside, an outside person would really, I was free all along, right? Yeah. I just had to exert it. I had to practice it. Um, I do want to say, I've heard some really good points and I like lists. So if y'all don't mind, I'd like to list off some things that I've heard talked about. Asking questions, talking one-on-one, -on -one, listening, exerting patience and remembering that it's a journey, it's an evolution and people aren't going to change overnight and finding common ground. I feel like we found five really cool things to sort of keep in mind when we're talking to people. And we posted in the chat a link to the book called The Four Agreements. Have any of you read The Four Agreements? This is, in my opinion, the way to function at the dinner table. It's really simple. This is a way that you can communicate with people and not, well, maybe not get triggered uh, externally, right? Um, it's be impeccable with your words. So if you're, if you're advocating for something, don't say statements that aren't exactly true. If it's, they're trying to sterilize us all through vaccines, you might be able to say there's, documentation that the Gates Foundation sterilized people in this year at this time with vaccines, right? There's an example. So be impeccable with your work. Don't speak in broad statements. Don't lump everybody together. Um, don't take anything personal. Know that sometimes political stuff, spiritual stuff, people get triggered. So you don't take it personal. Don't make any assumptions. Don't assume that because somebody wants a wall that they're a Trump supporter. And don't assume that they're a status, you know, like come from a place of open mindedness. I think that was something else I heard too. I think I'm going to add that as number six is open mindedness. And then always do your best, right? Just, just be your best person possible. And, um, you know, I think that whether our family comes from the extreme right or the extreme left, it is possible to find common ground. And it's possible to find the areas in which they seek freedom as a human being. Because ultimately, I think that is our greatest calling <clears throat> as people is to be free and to exert our freedom on the world in some creative way. It's different for all of us, right? So if we can find those little nuggets of common ground and plant those seeds, I think our conversations can go really well over the holidays. Maybe. Hey, Catherine, there's something that you wrote in a, a Facebook post just the other day that I really liked. I thought you might get on. And that was that 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 post about you uh, saying, I surrender to no longer being, you know, distressed or, or uh, you know, uh, triggered, I guess, to some degree. You want to talk yeah, about that a little? Sure. I, th I think that's a great yeah. I think that's a great one. Yeah, I was talking about fall and the leaves are falling down and it's mother nature's way of showing us surrender in action and just letting go and releasing. And something that I think I've suffered with and struggled with over the past decade plus since beginning the process of waking up is this desire to change everyone, change everything, make the world be a certain way. And that created some animosity that people picked up on. I have in the past, maybe five years ago, apologized on Facebook because I would say things with those broad sweeping statements, right? That everybody should cloth diaper and everybody should not vaccinate and everybody should eat organic, right? And I was just dictating. And it was very combative. And I've come to realize that I would rather enjoy a meal with you than be right. I would rather enjoy my time with you and get to know you and experience the beauty that is you than be right. 
and I don't want to fight anymore. I don't have the energy for it. I spent a long time fighting. I fought through the political process, through the Ron Paul campaign, then at the state legislature, and then at the city council level, and then it became at the philosophical level, and then I was fighting for my health after a spider bite. And I'm realizing now that just surrendering into freedom is the simplest path to freedom. Because when you're fighting your way there, you're exerting so much energy, it's actually kind of draining. I was making myself sick trying to be free. And so this is why I'm really into the health and wellness stuff. I know that Dr. Buckley had, had joined in. I, I hope he's still on and willing to turn on his mic. But um, I made myself sick fighting for freedom. And I alienated myself and I alienated family members. I mean, I, I have a Federal Reserve Bank board member in my family. I have people, I have teachers in my family and unschooling only, you know, and it's like, I have police officers in my family. I alienated myself. And thankfully, through the process of my grandmother transitioning, I was able to sort of rejoin my family. And it's, it, it was a really interesting process that took place about two and a half years ago. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm reaching this point where I don't want to fight for anything anymore. And if you're going to try to fight me, I surrender. And I think that's the beauty of the story of Jesus, right? He just surrendered. He turned the other cheek. And what that does is it shows the violence of the world and no one can paint you as violent and you don't have to exert the energy, right? And so, you know, I'm going through a legal case in my life right now and all this political stuff and whatever. And I just, I don't want to fight anymore. And wow, has that improved my relationships? <laughs> Wow, in such a big way. So thank you for yeah. bringing that up, Michael. Thank hey, you. I want to share something that you mentioned also is like, you'd rather share a meal with somebody than be right. And mm. I think for me, like I, just in the last like in the 18 months, 24 months, understanding who I've been to family members or you no, know, mostly family members, right? Because other people are really trying to like win over. But then to apologize for being like super over eager or like trying to, you know, because Remember, the way we communicate might not be how it's perceived, right? So their perception mm -hmm. is their experience and their reality. So to some family members who I really love and um, I, I received some messaging from them, it's like, I got to apologize for the way I was communicating because I had this belief, I had this, you know, idea and intention and I didn't communicate it clearly. And so to come from that, again, not trying to be right, but like admitting our wrongs and like you said, it's like being somebody that they want to be around, not because, you know, you're trying you're righteous or something, but because you're a good dude, you're a good lady and they appreciate you and your service. And then, you know, I'm glad you brought up Jesus because like he said, if you want to be great, you know, serve the masses, serve the many. And this is the perversion with the, you know, police to protect and serve, you know, and there's that, that shirt with the, you know, the baton to protect and serve the shit out of you. But in terms of like, you know, serving people, if we can do that a service, it's a long game, you know, and that's why I really like the term, the, um, you know, the state is intergenerational organized crime. And one of my speeches I gave recently was about intergener intergenerational freedom. So this, con con mm. this is good stuff, like just kind of understanding that we're not alone in these conversations, but like maybe a list, you know, I think we saw that the, the moderator will make a, a copy of the comments here, but like. This is good stuff. You know, we can probably chop this up and find some, some good highlights about what we can do. And maybe, I don't know. I know, Angie, you're into like NVC. So I'm a, I'm a newbie for the nonviolent communication. But it's like, maybe like state your feelings and then you kind of make a request or something. I don't know, um, kind of your understanding or how it might uh, correlate into what we're talking about now. One of the things, the reason I really like nonviolent communication is because it's about empathy. And one of the more important parts of it to me is self-empathy. Um, and this is how I think you stop yourself from getting triggered <laughs> when you're at the dinner table. And yeah. as you're listening to people say things that you don't agree with, and maybe you're having feelings rise up in you, I think it helps you to just assess what you're feeling, why you're feeling it what you value and what needs you aren't getting met, right? And then it becomes, and that's, so that's part of it. So you know where you are. And then you start to look at the other person and you say, 
you say, well, why are they saying these things? What needs are they with the beliefs that they have? What needs are they trying to get met? Right. So, and, and like, are those valid needs? Well, yeah, like you, you want to validate people's needs and their concerns. And then once you validate their needs and their concerns, um, then you can work together to figure out the solution. And then you can have positive, what you, what you refer to as positive, doable, or crest. So maybe it might, maybe it might be something like, yeah, I really think you're right about, um, about the idea of helping the poor. Um, and it sounds to me like you really are concerned. You're one of the people in the world who care about this thing. Can I ask you to you know, read this book or read this article? I think it might really like help you to figure out the way to really support the ideas um, or support, support the position that you want. So it's like that kind of a thing. It's a very different thing to communicate. Um, and like, and, and another thing is like, you're not going to be able to say everything at the dinner table. Most of us aren't equipped even to really talk about a lot of the things we believe in because there's so much that we have a mass, so much information that we have a mass up to the point that we're standing in front of someone. And even when I'm talking here, I have this problem. I'm like, oh my God, I've read this book and that book and this book and that book. And I want to put it, I want to condense it so I can make it a little nugget for you. And it's like, I can't do that. Um, and so like task using your, not getting triggered such that you can sit there and say, um, you know, really ask them to do something that will help them to further their own goals. Jessica asked a question and made a good point. And I think this is a really good one to talk about at the dinner table is as she said, like, well, he, a good question is what woke you up? So if you're, if you're talking about your experience where you were before, um, before a Thanksgiving dinner, but before you were an anarchist or believed the things you believe, and then talking about how you got there, I think that's a really good way to communicate um, because people like stories. They want to hear your story. And you can, and a lot of what you say about who you were before, they're going to relate to that. And then you can show them how you moved out of that space and into a new space because you, you know, because you're aligning your values with your actions or whatever. So I think that was a good, a good point. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to share what was, what it was that woke you up, but I think it, so for me, it was Ron Paul and Murray Rothbard, right? For me, actually, for me, it was the moment Ron Paul said, they don't hate us because of our freedoms. They hate us because we've been over there. And I had been, and so at that time, what most concerned me was the war. And so when he said that, it was like oh, puzzle pieces into place, right? And now I understand something about the world that I did not understand before. And I know, and I now have an avenue to travel down to get information. And I went on to get a lot of information and it changed the way I think about the state and war, right? Like see that story? And maybe that means that they're gonna, my, my, my family members are going to ask me questions now. And then I can proselytize <laughs> after they ask me questions. <laughs> You know what it was for me? You know, Angel, no, it's really important ahead. that if, if we... Go ahead. No, go ahead, David. Well, I was going to say the... Um, okay. The so. um, Murray Rothbard. I will, I'll give it back to you. I think there's a slight delay. I'll give it back to you. Give me two seconds here. But the... Uh, for New Liberty. Because I was like, okay, if the, the politicians are bad, like, how's it all going to work? You know, like, I, there's an analytical side of my brain. It's like, seriously, the police... The fire and like the, the you know a little bit of the roads and the road was like the police you know so um, anyways it was <laughs> it was that book that really it was an audio book I listened to a few times I said oh man this is all gonna work out there'll be like insurance companies that have you know in, uh, uh, incentives and vested interest and the checks and balances just we don't need these criminal organizations using intimidation and force and violence against us all right cats all you. <laughs> Okay, so I was going to say one, yes, being a beacon so that people are asking us questions is really important, I think. And two, it was Ron Paul that woke me up as well. But for me, it was actually standing on the floor of the RNC. I was a delegate for the state of Missouri in 2008. And I realized I was an extra on a TV set. I had no political whole whatsoever what was the point of becoming a delegate I, I couldn't believe how much time and energy and hope and faith and resources we had put into the delegate process to show up 
And really, we were just ordered around, told what to do. We were given chant cards like, you know, stop cheering. Sarah Palin's got to be on for prime time and chant this after this speaker and chant that after that speaker and I'm like sitting with my legs like this because there's photographers in the rows in front of us it's like why am I here what, what am I doing here and so that's I started questioning the political system because of my Ron Paul experience but it's when I got to the Porcupine Freedom Festival that I met anarchists and I because I didn't know what anarchy was and I, I learned the difference between minarchy and anarchy and in 2010 it hit me like a bolt of lightning. I was giving a rant on stage and I ended it with, I'm a mother effing anarchist. It like hit me in the moment that I was an anarchist, you know, it was being around the community. And so that's why for me, Anarchapoco is so important because every time I'm around the community, I have new realizations. I learn new things. I expand in such huge ways. And I think it makes me a better person and it helps me to go back out into the world and communicate my ideas more softly, more gently, more respectfully with more curiosity, genuine curiosity, as opposed to like Angel said, proselytizing, you know, I, I don't feel the need to do that anymore. And I just want to be the best person I can be and this taps back into the surrender because really I want people asking me, I don't want to be trying to, you know, pull my hair out convincing someone of something I want to talk to a willing audience and so if I'm living a life that is so interesting and, and intriguing to someone that they're asking me questions that's what I want you know I want people asking me questions and did you know David that my dog's name is Murray Rothbark I didn't think you knew that <laughs> Rothbark that's beautiful hey that's how you yeah. do it right Name your pets, you know, these uh, anarcho-capitalists, you know, dogs and cats. And then you you have a parrot and you just name all your pets these guys' names. And pretty soon they're like, man, where, where are these guys coming from? Do you have a book that your dog wrote or something I could read or something? Exactly. <laughs> I've had so many conversations at the dog park. <laughs> um, I wanted to go to a comment um, that Jay made about the personal versus the non-personal conversation. Um, and I wasn't sure what he meant, but um, he's talking about how some ideas are better, um, better discussed in person um, rather than via text. I think almost all discussions are better in person. <laughs> 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 I have seen that go way wrong, but mm -hmm. also looking at people in the eyes, that's a real, because you're so much less likely, I think, to, um, to call them names or be dismissive, dismissive of their humanity. Um, um, but I actually, to your point, I actually came across a website recently that I thought was really great that's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to encourage dialogue and it's called Letters or Letter or something. I, I'll, I'll look it up. I wasn't planning on talking about it, but uh, Jay saying that made me think of it. Uh, but I love it because what you do there is you write a letter to someone about some idea, right? It might be anarchist philosophy. And then you, you have someone respond to the letter and you guys can go back and forth, but it, you create a dialogue and the dialogue is supposed to, uh, you're not supposed to go into calling names. It's really supposed to be like getting into the ideas and presenting them and fleshing them out. And I really think that's something that's missing because we have these constant back and forth on Facebook or uh, Twitter or in Twitter, I mean, like you get a few characters, so you're trying to make that pithy and usually the easiest way to do that is to go on the attack. Whereas in this, you get to have this discussion back and forth with someone and the audience can look in on it and read you really like, and like addressing the person. The one thing that I don't like about those address, about I, when you're, when there's not a back and forth, um, or if there's some sort of a delay, like you complete, you present a complete argument and then another person presents a complete argument is sometimes you don't address each other's um, counter arguments. So that's where it can get dicey. And that's where like a back and forth one-on-one -on -one really is good because there's that listening part. There is like, uh, like Michael said, you're pulling the, 
the um, what was it a uh, the handkerchief through first before you start putting yours in, and I think that's mm-hmm. really a really important part of the dynamic. But um, I mean, there's all these different ways to communicate, but you're about to be in the back and forth. <laughs> so everybody, visualize, visualize the what was it the that you said, Michael the not tunnel, what is it, um, like the tube, mm-hmm. visualize the tube, visualize pulling their tube through first, and then putting yours in, that's what she said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dinner <laughs> table talk right there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so you guys, we have a question on YouTube, since we're talking about people asking us questions. Fishbones on YouTube is asking a question about the an anarchist society. So I figured this would be a good opportunity for us to do a little practice here. Does an anarchist society work with the Spartan system of governance where the kings are replaced with leaders that can be replaced through an election every three years? I don't see why that couldn't be the case for some communities if they choose that. I think you'll see, because you're going to see governance no matter what. The question is what kind of governance, and I think in a free and decentralized society, we're going to see many different solutions. And it and it really will, like even if one solution is works for a certain community, it might not work for every community. I mean, if you look at Switzerland, I mean, from what I've heard from a lot of people, they've got governance down, and it's because it's very local, it's homogenous, and it, it's, they're like small cannons or whatever, and they, they have a very unified culture. So, and some people would look at that and say, oh, we can just do that everywhere. Everything doesn't work for everyone. So you might have a community where like a Spartan form of government, which I know nothing about, but that might work for people, right? All that matters for anarchists is that you can opt out of those systems when they don't work for you. Mm-hmm. Well, let me, uh, if, I don't mind, if you don't mind me chiming in, I'd just like Chime to uh, in. Uh, you know, point out like the idea of entrepreneurial problem solving. And essentially, w- when we have a lot of thinking people, we're, we're really problem solvers. And, and that's a beneficial thing where we can get paid because we're demonstrating something of value. And so in most cases, just like leasing or building the roads or anything else, those are things that people value, and if you present a case that solves the problem, then more than likely people will pay you for it. And, and certainly that's one of the things when, as we start to progress down that path of having those opportunities, it's really not about one particular government or one particular entity providing that service. There could be bunches of different, it could be corporations providing that, there could be sole proprietors that, you know, uh, if you lived out in the country where you had to have your garbage uh, taken by, you know, either a neighbor or uh, like waste management or something like that, would pay to like drop off a dumpster or something, you, you know that there's, there's different ways that that problem can be solved and it gets solved. And, and that's really, I think most of the stuff that we, that we believe is, part of government really doesn't necessarily need to be part of government at all once we realize that it's it's a service that can be provided by an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Well, this is, so, yeah, I think there will be a lot of competing types of governance models. Catherine, you might be able to speak to like how Sharon Mexico does it. You know, they've had, uh, you know, no politicians for, was it, eight or ten years now, and they have like kind of a little representative. I think it's like for every... Block, I mean, a hundred people, they have their own little representative and they go to like the, the meetings and that representative communicates to the group what their hundred people in their village are, you know, what the problems are for that week or for that month. And then through that representative, they, you know, get their problem solved. Um, it seems like there might be some form. I mean, that's a, definitely a form of representative, but the idea, like you said, is that you can opt out at any time, at any point, um, you know, you just withdraw your consent. And this is another question of like, are these representatives paid in Sharon? I don't know if, if you know that question um, or the answer to that, Catherine. Are, that, are they paid or they're just volunteers? Because they got like 20,000 people in that in that town. So it's a massive um, operation, I would think, to do hold those meetings. Um, but the idea that there will be competing models, I think, is very exciting because for the last 200 years and 
maybe even before, they just have the constitutional republic, you know, and there's less, it's a monopoly on these locations and localities. And what an inefficient way to evolve or to innovate is to have it monopolized by these people. And so oh, I'm interested to see how it all unfold. But um, that's good points about the problem solving and how that's really what it is. And if we all agree, I think the, the culture of the city or the culture of the village will have to be established in the beginning, just like how the Declaration of Independence established the culture you know, of America was like, hey, we know we're cutting ties from England and we want to be free. We have these unalienable rights. Da, da, da. So that kind of set in motion things that occurred later. And I think there's layers of merit to that, you know? So like I dream of having like my own villages or a community and then say like, here's our declaration of independence and we're just cutting ties from you criminal organizations. And, you know, we're going to be sustainable as much as we can within ourselves. And then, then we work out the question of, you know, what about the roads? Or it's just like, Hey, we're just all going to pitch in, you know, we're all going to contribute and uh, just based on voluntary interactions we will solve the problem way better and more peacefully than the, these guys who are using coercion um, but i would love to see the competitive you know models of governance like that's very exciting the idea of that yeah i think that's a beautiful idea and in fact there was a question that came in asking how do we get to anarchy what does it look like to get from here to there so she runs a really great example right so Chiron was a community, they are a community in Mexico, and they were being overrun by the cartel and by government officials. The trees in their forest were being clear cut, sold for logging money, and then the cartel was planting avocado trees, which are not indigenous to that forest. The root systems are different, and their water supply was drying up. So here's a problem. Water supply is drying up. What happened is that the women in the community stood up and said no, and they started blocking the road so that the loggers could not steal their trees. And this to them was their historical family land. This didn't belong to anybody. This was the forest. This is what provided for them. So inevitably what happens is the cartels initiated force against the women who were blocking the road. Was that force? I don't know. For the people who were stealing their trees and taking away their water supply, is that force, right? And things went down and they ended up reclaiming their community. And now there's checkpoints when you drive in, I've driven through it, and they want to make sure that you're not a gangster of the political type or the cartel type. And they want to make sure that you're coming into their community to be productive and kind. And there's only one hotel in this community. I mean, it is in, it is in the forest. It is deep in the woods, in the mountains. And there are no Starbucks. There are no corporate grocery stores. When you go walking through that town, there's really not even hours posted on the storefronts. It's very, very familiar, family-oriented. And the way that they elect their government is through word of mouth. There's no yard signs there's no political campaigning there's no written ballot they come belly to belly face to face they get together and they choose who's going going to represent them it's a volunteer community and they really care about each other and they care about the community and in order to actually join their community you have to marry in or be born there they feel very strongly that they want to preserve their culture and their history but, okay, I stand out like a sore thumb, obviously, right, walking through this Mexican indigenous community, and people were just running up to me. I speak English. I worked in San Antonio for seven years, and I, I worked in Alabama. And so there, this community, a lot of them, they're going out, they're, they're bringing resources home, and they're trying to create infrastructure there because they have kicked out the state and the federal government. Now, they do have license plates on their cars because when they leave their community, you know, they don't want to be targeted, right? So they, you know, they do play ball in certain areas when it involves interacting with the community at large. Um, but overall, that, that was how it worked for them is that they had a problem. They were losing their water supply. They were losing their way of life. Their, their forests were being clear cut and they took their community back. 
I think for all of us, it could look very different. I think, you know, there's a community I really like in Ohio called Raven Rocks Eco Village, and they were from the Quaker community and they came together and they created an eco village and they, you know, they protected the land in a land trust. They took a different way of doing it, but their homes, they have homes that are completely off grid that have composting toilet and a hole in their counter for compost from the kitchen and um, shoots that go down for recycling. I mean, they have these really cool off grid homes. So, you know, I think to get from here to there, it's going to look different for everyone. I know for me, I want to be able to live in community. I don't want to fight though. So I want to find somewhere where I can go build that peacefully. So I, I want it, I want it, like I hear that and that's, that's, and I'm looking at what's happening in Hong Kong too. And like, to me, that's not the, uh, these aren't necessarily the ideal ways of getting to freedom. They might be necessary. There's that confrontation um, and confrontation with the state, I think, is inevitable. But I really want to go back to what Michael Nimitz said um, about entrepreneurship. Um, I love the marketplace, um, and I love it because it provides solutions, real-world solutions. I organize, I'm an event organizer, and I organize this other event, Future Frontiers. And one of the mantras, and it's my favorite mantra, and coming across this mantra has changed the way I interact with the world. But one of the mantras is criticize by creating, right? If there is something happening in the world that you don't like, go out there and create something different. Go out there and create something that not only competes with it, but just destroys that thing that makes it obsolete, to, that makes it an antiquated thing of the past. And we see that happening with Bitcoin. We see that happening with like Uber and Lyft. Although Uber and Lyft have taken it has been somewhat corrupted because of the existence of the state. They came in and they got rid of like the taxi um, monopoly, but then they, but then of course the government went in to regulate it. And then Uber and Lyft started, um, you know, like they were fighting for regulations that really would have made access to the, the industry a little more difficult. But anyway, but, but that's kind of beside the point. The point is to create systems, to create things that really, that really compete with government systems such that we don't have to confront them. We just move, we just move out of their systems. We move out of their money. We move um, into areas. And, it, and so it's going to look different. And it's also going to be taking ownership and responsibility. So many people are dependent on the state. And so long as they are dependent on the state, it's going to be hard to get them to, to you know, get hard to get them to stop supporting the state. So if people in your community need childcare, then it's time for you to maybe like create that business that provides it to them at low cost so that you guys build and maybe hire people from within your community and private defense, right? Start a private defense that hires the people in the community that is funded by the people in the community. This is the way that we get them out of our lives. And it makes it less, it makes it much more difficult for the government to claim that what it's doing is right. If we've created systems already and they're in place and you're just taxing us for no reason now. That's what I think. That's, that's, that's how I want to see this happen because I don't want to see people fighting in the streets. I do not want to have to lob Molotov, Molotov cocktails <laughs> um, anywhere. That's not my preference. It's cool in video games, not so much in the real world, you know? Um, so that's kind of how I see it happening. And also, and one of the things I want to say about that is that you might not be a creator. I'm not Elon Musk. I'm not going to build a spaceship. That's just not going to happen. But I can insert myself into um, and support organizations that do that kind of thing. So you don't, you could be a secretary and that could be your way to help. You could be a secretary at a Bitcoin company, let's just say. And that could be your way to support something that is circumventing the system. If I can throw in you here a little bit. You can be a mom. You can raise free babies. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I was just, you guys need to listen to uh, David's interview with Richard Grove. He's, he, he hits a lot of these uh, things in that regard. 
uh, you know, the, the, I think one of the points that uh, you made, Angel, that I, I think is really key is, is we create our way out of the situation. You know, the, the government and, you know, what, they're, what they do is force. They're using force. That is a lower consciousness frame of mind. That's, that's not a creative frame of mind. That's not using their brain. That's using their, like, their animal brain. You know, our, as a human, our neocortex is really the thing that makes us a human. And, and that's not what government is using. They're using the, the, the base brain, the, the, you know, the, the base needs, the base fears, and that kind of thing. And really, violence is, a, is, is an act of desperation. And so, you know, like what, uh, what Dale Brown, in, in regard to his circumstance with, uh, like, Detroit, for example, where the police, you know, like if you call the police in Detroit, they might come out two or three hours later, you know, whereas Dale Brown has kind of taught, you know, the local people to like help each other. And so like you have a situation where instead of uh, you calling the, the police, you call the neighbor and the neighbor comes over in five minutes and lo and behold, the problem is solved well before the police even get there. You know, and so these are the kind of opportunities that we have because the government is always stealing more money and, and their service is always decreasing because it's a system that nobody likes and, and it just it is depleting in a, of energy. And the more the more we are in being creative and helpful and, you know, coming from the heart and loving each other and all these kind of things, the more we generate energy that other people can see and and benefit from and and we become more valuable i I think one of the things i did want to point out is that you know we're when we go to this um, you know mandatory schooling for 12 years we're getting like fifteen thousand hours of conditioning and if you've uh, read that book i'm not sure what's called the, uh, the tipping point malcolm gladwell you know, that 10,000 hours is what it takes to make you an expert. We're getting 15,000 hours in essentially self-defeating behavior. You know, we're being, we're being taught to be experts at being self-defeating. And so in a lot of cases, and I think this is something that also goes to addressing, you know, how to be empathetic towards other people, is, you know, we've all been taught and we all kind of recognize our faults more than we recognize what's our strengths. And so this is another area that I think that we can use to our advantage in regard to you know, empathizing with people when they, they feel weak, but then being able to reassure them and encourage them with what, they, what their strengths are. And, you know, like, demonstrating to them that they have value and that there is something that they can help other people with that is valuable you know and because just because people won't pay money for it doesn't mean it isn't valuable you know quality of life is something that we we can also identify because there's all kinds of things that we can do for each other that maybe we can't get money for but they are incredibly valuable. And so, you know, just like spending time with people, for example, I mean, that, is, that is one that, uh, um, you know, is incredibly valuable and, and listening. You know, I, I don't want to spend too much time, but I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. And, um, you know, I, I added to my list, I think I had six earlier, I added face to face and eye contact to it and creative solutions. And I think talking about the positive things that we can do to overcome some of the obstacles that maybe people are triggered about if we're having conversations at the dinner table. Um, We are going to start wrapping up here. And I wanted to open the floor to see if there's anybody else who wants to contribute, if Ken or Shella or Jay or any of you have something else that you would like to say, and I'm going to review the notes I've taken. I may have missed some things. This is not a comprehensive list. But for the holidays, talking about anarchy, we have ask questions, talk to people one-on-one, listen, be patient. It's a long, slow journey. It's an evolution. 
find common ground, stay open-minded, make eye contact, be human, right? And let's talk about creative solutions instead of maybe talking about negative things or maybe things that we have conflict on. So, hey, yeah, hey. I saw you chatting in there about the education system. Yes, Angel, go ahead. Okay, I just want to take a couple of minutes where I'm going to run off topic, but I really want to bring, um, I, and I don't know if, I don't know if I'm saying your name incorrectly, but Ahmad or Ahamd Yusufan on for a second. He's in Iran and he has, um, you know, there's a lot of strife happening over in Iran right now. And uh, I would love to give him an opportunity to share it with us because we care and um, this is relevant to everything that we're talking about. Um, and so when, when you come on, can you say your names? Because <laughs> I know I screwed it up. Um, I can't unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm from Iran and. Uh, there was an other here, back seat and So gonna, uh, it's a little bit difficult to hear you. Okay. Sorry. Is it better? Is it better? Oh yeah. Sorry. Better. Okay. Uh, I'm from Iran. I there was a unrest here last week and the government uh, put everything it could to um, make this unrest uh, um, unmovable and take them out of the streets by automatic guns, even some places with uh, helicopters. And I heard about even tanks in some uh, villages because uh, they have the power, they can do whatever they want. It's more related to what we call here about uh, weapon and people should people should have weapon in their hands to defend themselves in this situation against states or whoever and other things. So I think this uh, movement and having a conversation about this even in other uh, places is important because uh, there are some governments which uh, worse than yours and uh, they need to change they need to be silent but uh, I don't know what should I say more about uh, what it happened because I didn't part of I wasn't part of it I wasn't uh, protesting I just uh, listened to news on uh, I was not uh, in uh, official news uh, mostly telegram news and chat rooms and videos uh, where people could uh, send after banning the internet because the internet was banned for six days here almost everywhere and uh, we could not even uh, talk to everyone we could not send email or uh, whatever you think about the internet and right now, mobile phone and cell phone are uh, disconnected from internet, and we just can have uh, internal websites and governmental websites. Uh, I don't think uh, you can compare it to other uh, governments, just you can compare to maybe North Korea, but the North Korea, Korea government is not uh, clergy government is mostly a dictatorship uh, or uh, we should say uh, classic dictatorship but here is mostly about religion and I think people about um, foolishing them about what religion can do with a state and uh, you pass it for decades for centuries when you separate your government separate church and the state. But here it just started after all these uh, years. Okay, I do not I do not know what should I say more about. It. So okay, so the government there are protesters right now. What are what exactly are they protesting? 
Yes, it started about economics. They uh, priced up, uh, uh, I should say, fuel of uh, automobiles, uh, oil, not exactly oil, but we put in um, cars. Okay, yeah. they uh, triple the price of oil uh, and the unrest uh, started with this event. Just in the middle of night, uh, the government, three officials had, uh, high rank officials had a meeting and decided to uh, triple the price of uh, uh, oil. Not exactly oil, I'm just going to know what to say, uh, exact English word. Gasoline. For, uh, not gasoline. Here we use something else. Older. You use gasoline, but we use benzene. What should I say? In yeah. English. Diesel? Uh, then uh, unrest started uh, after that uh, uh, declaration. So the government, so there are protests, and the government is using deadly violence against the protesters right yeah. now. Right now, so yes, no, not right now. No, it's finished. It's almost finished. It is uh, because they uh, punch every people in the street, uh, um, blood shed, and whatever you can think, uh, because they have. Uh, they think it's the right thing to do for. Uh, they should. They call it uh, security uh, of cities and a country, but uh, they were uh, just uh, unarmed protesters. And they could not do anything uh, very harmly or harmful. However, uh, there was some uh, um, uh, robberies and riots in some cities, but uh, it is not uh, something like uh, throwing government or like that. So, right. So, so in this in this city, then the people are disarmed. There are law anti lung anti gun laws. Yes, we don't have guns. It's, don't it's have guns. against rule here. Okay, we so, don't have guns. Uh, we cannot have. So, in my mind, and I can, I'm you know, I'm watching all of the propaganda, but in my mind, I'm looking at. I. I imagine Iran and I imagine like people with AK 47s like walking around the streets. Is that not, is that perception that we get here in the U S no, no. not the way that it is there, no. You know, but not everybody has a gun in every corner. No, no, no. It's, it, they are just, uh, uh, government officials, government soldiers or, um, uh, um, uh, Unregistered uh, soldiers, we, they call themselves uh, um, ordinary people, but they are not. They are part of the uh, military, uh, unofficial military in Iran. There are a lot of unofficial, unofficial military in Iran, and they use it uh, against people. Okay? They are not people. It, whatever you saw, they are not uh, ordinary people. Ordinary people does not have, uh, do not have a weapon, any kind of weapon. So then there's no way to defend yourself against the state now. Um, no. I, I mean, no. and it's a real lesson for any any country, any any peoples that still does retain some of their rights. Things like this are a real lesson. This is what happens. This mm -hmm. is the situation we can all find ourselves in if we if we allow them to take away our rights and um and it's too, it's really sad and it's real. It's real. We're not talking about when we talk, when we advocate for gun rights, mm -hmm. people have this idea like it, like we live in some fantasy world, but we live in the real world where we can look around the world and see what governments are doing to people who are just trying to okay, city, people who are just trying to live and, and make things work. And I and, and I just and it's like I can't, um, I can't ignore the the U.S. government in the room because a lot of what's happening right now, I think, is related to the sanctions that the U.S. government has placed mm -hmm. on Iran, making it very difficult. So it's creating these tensions between the people and the government, um, and I, I, you know, it just exacerbates. Government in general just exacerbates every problem. No, no, I. 
funny. But the, the, the good thing is that it can breed creative solutions, you know, and I mean, there's a silver lining to all of these, right? And when the human being, the human creature squeeze so tightly that they are desperate for him with the loved ones and they are desperate for a way to get out of the, un, from under the thumb of the state, this is when the creative solutions began to spring forth. And so I will be curious what innovations in technology are going to happen because of this global unrest that is taking place right now. You know, we, we have across the globe massive unrest taking place where you have the people versus the state. You have individuals standing up against tanks and machine guns and throwing rocks and just doing what they can to defend themselves. So what sort of innovative solutions are going to be born out of 2019 unrest? That's what I want to know. Michael's got something to say. Well, well, he's getting right there. Though. Yeah, I think humans, the, the, the spirit for freedom, the desire for freedom is rising. You know, and like you mentioned the global unrest. Our media is so controlled. We don't see the pictures of France or, you know, even, even like Hong Kong, you know, like so under the wraps. So... If these people can get the idea of volunteers, and this is the video I just posted right there, that was like a four-minute video. So it's less bashing the states. You give it more um, details about the concept of volunteerism. And it's, as it relates to the conversation that we're having, um, I, I use the word volunteerist or volunteerism in the conversation because it's less scary, right? Because using the word anarchy, there's shocks some people. And if like, I'm in a short conversation, I'm, you know, it's, it makes sense. I'll drop, drop the A-bomb on them. But, you know, <laughs> volunteerism, I like volunteerism because it is intentional, right? It is saying what it is, and it hasn't been bastardized by the state, which for generations has been using the word anarchy to mean Molotov cocktails. And, um, you know, as I don't know if you guys saw the new the interview with Vinnie Paz, the musical act there in Arcapoco, he brought up how the punks, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s, they took the anarchy sign and they put it on their leather jackets and they used it to be, you know, kind of like the violent, you know, image that it's portrayed in reality. It's just, you know, the self ownership that we know that it is. So um, speaking about volunteerism could be a good topic for the turkey dinner or the ham or whatever you guys are having stuffing and say, Hey, have you ever heard of volunteerism? I just came across this amazing idea and would you watch this video? You know, maybe you can take a look at this and give me your opinion on it. It's like a whole new revolutionary paradigm of how society could be run. And I'd like to get your opinion on it and let mm. me know what you think, you know, kind of like have a kind of a table topic starter of like, what do you think about these concepts of not aggressing against people, not stealing people's stuff? Like, what do you think, you know, and genuinely not like as a manipulation tactic, but like genuinely, like, isn't this, Fucking cool, dude. Like, look at this. This is great. But, like, what do you think, you know? I'm loving that. So Ken's asking in the chat when Thanksgiving is, for those of you around the world who do not celebrate the white man coming and taking over this section of North America and sending all of the natives into little reservations, Thanksgiving mm. is in two days on Thursday. In case you were wondering... Okay, so Ken, is there anything you want to add to the conversation here? I didn't see Michael pop back in. Is, is he here? I know he had wanted to say something. No, I think um, Michael. Really okay. Go ahead, Ken. No, I was just saying, not, not really. Um, this is a great conversation about this stuff. It's just really hard to communicate it. And hopefully someday I can see Larkin Rose um, in person and go to his um what's it called candles oh, in candles, the dark yeah candles in the dark um just because you know it's just it just seems like i don't know if it's cognitive dissonance or it's just people you know they put up that wall immediately when you try to talk about any of this kind of stuff and like in my heart i'm just trying to help people you know but it's so it, it comes out sounding so abrasive so like you know, anti this and anti that. And it's like, it's not about that for me. It's about like finding the solutions and sharing those solutions with people, just trying to, 
get them to nod their head yes so that you know i can see that they at least understand what i'm saying so whether they take that advice or not is you know up to them but it's it's really tough to talk about this kind of stuff yeah it really is and so i think one of the things that david had said earlier leaving people where they are is sometimes the best thing to do because it is so hard to talk about now, someone named Matthew is sharing his screen, and it's the free man's perspective. Are you unmuted? Do you want to talk about what you're sharing here? Into your email to join other freedom seekers who choose to see the world as it really is. Get a free report that explains how to live on your own terms. Let's see. I'm trying to see if, if he's there to talk. Oh, he said, nope, doesn't want to talk. Okay. Cool. We'll check that out, guys. <laughs> I'll go check it out. I don't know anything about what we're looking at. I'm trying to see if there's a URL there. So, okay. Angel, David, Turkey Talk, Holidays, Table Talk. What are your takeaways from this conversation today? Um, so I, I, I'm lucky. Well, I don't, know if, I don't know if I want to say lucky in my family might be watching this, but I, I live in Texas. <laughs> my family lives across the country and I love them. I love my family, um, but I will not be getting together with them. I will be getting together at a Friendsgiving. Um, and the good thing about Friendsgivings is that my friends generally are on the same page with me about we have our little disagreements, but like in principle, we are we're in the same space, so so I don't have to worry as much about communicating. Um, and so, if if you find if you find that you 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 are not past the point of being triggered, you might want to consider going to a friendsgiving uh, um, and and making that a bigger part of your experience. Um, so that's one thing I want to say. Um, Beyond that, you know, just remember, try not to get triggered. Try to understand that everybody's on their own journey and it isn't about you. It's about them and it's about their fears and their concerns. And, um, and it takes time for people to understand, um, to come into contact with the enough point, data points and information to really come to the place where you've come and you're not going to impart that in any single conversation. And if you take that perspective, then your communication with people will be more about connecting and caring and showing empathy than it will be about getting to a point. And so that that's that's the that's probably the takeaway is I think that will prepare people to really engage and connect on Thanksgiving. And I also want to say thank you so much. Um, maybe I'm saying your name wrong, Ahmad. Um, for sharing your experience with us and what's happening with you. And uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, we don't want to gloss over it because we know you're in a real world situation and we'll be eating turkey in a few days. And you're in a place where there are people who are, you know, who are suffering the consequences of government. And we talk about that every week. So I just want to make sure that you understand, like, I don't know how we can support you here, but I'm glad that we just even have a chance to give you a voice to say that this is what's happening in your world right now. And your voice makes our voice stronger. So thank you so much for sharing it. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. I didn't know about all these things happening in Iran. Um, but I think what's really exciting is we're unified, understanding that the state is organized crime. And we just want to have peaceful, voluntary relationships with people. My intention, as I'm with family, primarily this uh, you know season here, is to be present and to have empathy for their deep programming, their decades of hypnosis and conditioning. As I am, we have to have self empathy for ourselves and understand we're all evolving, still unfolding, you know, in front of ourselves. And I got, I don't, I don't need to be right. I don't want to be right. I'm trying to give some information to them, plant those seeds, and maybe in a year or five or ten years, or maybe you know. Some fruit will come out of it. If not, we got to build. I love that quote that you mentioned. Um, Criticize by creating. The Buckminster Fuller quote. Don't fight reality. Just make the new model. So it makes the old one obsolete. I think there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of strength and power in that. 
And what's exciting is we've been saying that since the first year, 2015, because that's a real meme. That has legs. That's got meat on the bones. So the more people who can get that, you know, understanding, they'll stop going to the ballot booths and trying to get this left guy, right guy, that. But it's like we're looking in the mirror. We're looking at each other. You know, someone brought up the policing force. Like, call your neighbor. I recommend not calling the cops. You know, like so many examples of dogs, you know, 100-pound dog. I saw eating this 90-year-old, 90-pound woman or something. It's just like the dog's getting shot. So the answer is us. And let us try to practice some of these tips that maybe cat will review again. Patience. One of the thing I want to add to that list is breathing. Sometimes when I get excited about something, I don't breathe. <laughs> so maybe that's like <laughs> point number seven or eight uh, that we can put on there. But um, yeah, I'm so um, honored you guys join us every week, um, you know, forever here. And um, look forward to seeing you in Anarchapoco when, when it arrives. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. And, um, man, so great to be here with, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, however many we have. And, um, man, let's talk about freedom, baby. Yeah, it is so great to be here with you guys. It's been really fun to have these conversations every Tuesday. It's one of my most favorite parts of every single week. I'll quickly review these, as David mentioned. Ask questions. Talk one-on-one. Listen. Be patient, plant those seeds, find common ground, stay open-minded, make eye contact, talk about creative solutions, and remember to breathe. And it's okay to ask a whole table full of people to take a deep breath. If things get too hot and heavy, that is okay. So we have some cool stuff going on here at Anarchapoco. Next week, every week, we are here on the Zoom, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitch, all over the internet having our conversations in anarchy. Next week, we're going to have the conversation we were going to have this week. We're getting back on track. And we are going to be talking about abortion, the right to life, and the pro-choice. Which is anarchist? Are either of them anarchists? Planned Parenthood, cloning, fetal tissue, rape and incest, some heavy stuff here, you guys, and parental rights, which is near and dear to my heart right now. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation, and I am really excited to have it. Every February, we have a fantastic event in Acapulco, Mexico. It is my favorite liberty event on the planet. I love getting together with my fellow anarchists and spending time on the beautiful beaches of Acapulco, Mexico, in the fantastic resort there at the Princess Hotel. I've got my son here making some noise in the kitchen. So thank you for your Thanksgiving patience. I'm so grateful. I just want to let you all know that hotel rooms are available. They are going to sell out. We are going to have some rooms that are unavailable because we are going to be experiencing some construction. There won't be construction noise, but there will be some rooms that will be shut down for renovation. So if you want to book a hotel and stay on site, which I highly recommend, it is so great to wake up in the morning, walk downstairs, eat breakfast, break bread, have community with fellow anarchists. It's really an awesome experience. We've already announced the main stage and the Dollar Vigilante speakers, the health and wellness stage, and we have so much more coming out. I think even this week we're going to have some announcements coming out. So keep your eye on the website. Really exciting stuff. If you haven't already, join our email list. We are doing speaker profiles of all the different speakers that are going to be there that are coming through right now. There's all sorts of great information and tips that come through. We also have a blog with a lot of fantastic content. If you go to anarchopoco.com, click on the blog link up there at the top. Uh, We have a what to expect section, an FAQ, and we're just constantly posting updates. And if you are interested in having your ticket paid for or making a little money spreading the word about an event you were going to be spreading the word about anyway, we do have an affiliate program where you can earn a little cash or maybe a lot of cash if you have a big network and you can use our affiliate program to give people a discount on their Anarchapoco ticket, which is super cool. They get a discount, you get a little cut, everybody wins, everybody gets to come together and have a really fantastic time There's a link at the top of anarchapoco.com and it says get involved. You can click that. And if you are interested in being a volunteer, if you want to be a speaker or a performer, you're probably going to be adding yourself to a potential list for 2021 because we are pretty booked right now. But 
go ahead and fill out those forms. We want you to be involved. We want to hear from you. So if you have something to contribute, please go ahead and get involved. We really look forward to that. Thank you to everyone who are joining us from Facebook, from YouTube, from DLive, Twitter, Twitch, right here on Zoom. If you want to be in the future, get on camera and have a part of the conversation. Be sure to sign up for that on our website at anarchapoco.com. From all of us here at Anarchapoco, I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of my community. I love you all dearly. We are signing off for today. Peace, love, and anarchy. Peace, love, and anarchy. Anarchapoco is so hype, I'm trying to tell ya. This the event of the year and best vacation ever. Ryan part of Jeffrey Tucker, just to name a few. Get your tickets, you don't want to miss it. You should roll through. Talking politics to health and self-improvement to invest in. So many things, not one thing. Learn how to live life unchained, yeah. Four days vibing on the beach, time to connect. All about growth, way more than a conference. This is Anarchapoco. Yeah, let's go. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs>